Welcome to the SOI Bridge podcast. Uh, today we have a, another episode and another show. My name is Kevin Huo. Um, just to briefly introduce myself, and then we'll introduce our amazing guest on the Bridge podcast today. Uh, my name is Kevin Huo, and again, uh, I was in the, a, one of the 2015 SOI alumni, so I was part of that Arctic expedition, and, and really excited, glad to be joining um, Kate today to talk a little bit about Arctic policy. Uh, in this episode of SOI Bridge, we'll be delving into the international Arctic policy world with policy special specialist, uh, Caitlin Herchak. Kate will be answering questions about what does policy look like? How can I implement policy to better my community? And how can I get involved in the policy world? So, Kate, take us away. Can you introduce yourself to all our listeners? Of course. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Kate Herchak. I am Enoch on my father's side from Kujarat, Quebec in Rankin Inlet, Nunavut. I am an Adams. Uh, Willie Adams Sr. is my great uncle and Eva Adams Classen is my late grandmother. <clears throat> and I am Celtic and Viking on my mother's side from North Ireland. And I've been born and raised on the Kwangan territory. So way the heck in Victoria, BC. Uh, I'm a master's student at the University of Victoria doing my master's of geography. Um, I am the manager of Indigenous Governance and Decolonial Practices and Policy at VIDEA. I'm the climate specialist at uh, Youth Climate Lab, and I'm also the interim chair for the Canadian Commission for UNESCO's Youth Advisory. Amazing, Kate. That's uh, quite a long list of amazing accolades, and that's why we're talking to you today, I think. Um, and I think I briefly forgot to mention that I'm calling today from uh, Fairbanks, Alaska, the ancestral lands of the Dana people of the Lower Tana River, um, so Fairbanks, Alaska. So, Kate, both you and I are very much West Coast, and uh, to all the SOI Bridge podcast listeners, West Coast represent. Uh, here we are Heck today. Yeah. Yeah. Heck yeah. And then uh, maybe East Coast folks next time we'll get you on the podcast. <laughs> um, but yeah, let's jump into it, Kate. Um, so, you know, we're talking a little bit about policy. So how did you get into policy work? That's an excellent question. Um, I fell into it kind of by accident. Um, <clears throat> I have a very, uncon like, very unconventional uh, origin story, if you will. Um, I used to compete in beauty pageants. And I was Miss Vancouver Island 2015 and Miss National Coastal British Columbia 2019. And then with my platforms, I was talking about Indigenous education and the importance of proper representation within academia, because everywhere I went, I felt like my people's stories, histories and experiences weren't reflected in academia. And I just kept talking about it. And eventually folks were like, you should be in rooms with these people and talk about it. You should talk about it over here and share your ideas and your perspective and your lived experience. So a lot of how I got into policy was through storytelling and always coming at it framed as this is great, but how can we make it better? And that's what I love about policy is like, it's so, sometimes it's very inflexible, but sometimes it can be very malleable, right? And if we keep telling our stories, eventually it makes it into policy. And that's something that's really exciting. Yeah, it's really interesting. You mentioned the, the storytelling aspect and essentially what we're doing here today. Um, but, you know, speaking of like kind of what you enjoy with regards to maybe storytelling, maybe you can elaborate more on this, but uh, what do you enjoy about working in policy or maybe what do you find most rewarding about working in policy? Ooh, what I find most rewarding about working in policy is that um, everybody has a relationship with policy, regardless if you think you do or not. So I always, when I work with youth, I'm like, do you drive a car? And they're like, well, yeah. And I'm like, policy, you know, you go to school, so much policy, you deal with the healthcare system, there's so much policy. And so folks have relationships with it. And sometimes they're really good relationships and other times they're really bad relationships. And so what I find rewarding through policy is knowing that I can make something that will tangibly make a difference in somebody's life. And hopefully it's for the better because I, I don't want to do things that hurt people, right? Because policy can be harmful. And so working from the place of like, how can we make this not harmful anymore or not even to begin with? And how will this affect people for a very long time? Yeah, there's something I think interesting about policy too, if I, if I may add, Kate, is, mm -hmm. is you know, the, the amount of people that you can impact 
by so little work sometimes, uh, which I know doesn't sound right, but you know it might just be adding a line in a committee meeting, right? Um, or it might be attending a, a assembly meeting and, and saying, I want this and it gets done, right? And it's just a small, minute little thing that can kick off a movement. That's, that's so super cool. Um, so Students on Ice is, as you may know, from people who come from around the world, but we all always end up in the Arctic, uh, be it Arctic or Antarctica. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, we always love to talk about, you know, how we can make our communities here in the Arctic better. Mm -hmm. So could you talk a little bit about maybe what Arctic policy is to you um, and maybe to our listeners what they could be working on with you, maybe, Kate? <laughs> mm -hmm. For sure. So my interaction with Arctic policy actually only started in 2019. Um, in 2019, I had the opportunity to go to COP25 as timely as this conversation is, because COP's happening right now. And uh, it was very exciting to me because uh, being born and raised in the South, having that disconnect from my own land and territory, but also feeling that need to be close to it or advocate for it or just, um, just love it, even though it's from afar. And at COP, I attended the... Indigenous caucus, right? And there's indigenous people from all over the world and Amazonians, the Peruvians, folks from Alaska, Siberia. And I was just like, oh my gosh, right? To like, wow, like what is it so beautiful to see so many indigenous people in a room, right? <clears throat> and uh, I got to meet Dr. Daly and she is just like super incredible. And uh, I asked if I could sit with her. And she said, oh, yeah, of course. And then she goes, oh, I know your grandpa. I know your grandma. You know, the circumpolar region is you know, <laughs> tiny. And uh, it was funny because I sat with her and we both had uh, black Earl Grey tea and three chocolate chip cookies. And I was like, yes, I am in deep down a very, very old Enoch woman. That is me. <laughs> I'm hopefully looking at my future. <laughs> and just uh, being able to sit with her and listen to what she advocates for and how she advocates for Arctic participation and policymaking was just like absolutely astounding to me. And uh, I think it's really fascinating um, the positionality of the Arctic uh, in the sense when it comes to like sovereignty over other countries, um, resource extraction, uh, protection, conservation, um, art, uh, economic development, like the Arctic is so multifaceted, right? And uh, absolutely fascinating. And it's just, it's not like anywhere else in the world, right? As all of you lovely SOI folks, right, have seen things that I haven't seen yet. And I think that's so cool. And uh, I think when we're advocating for our communities, um, I think it should be done through storytelling, right, of um, your relationship to each other, your relationship to the land, your relationship to what policies are currently in place that aren't working anymore. It's okay for policies not to work anymore. That means we just outgrew them, right? So since we go through these growing pains of policy, this is really exciting because it means it's time for new growth. And what can that look like in our communities will be very, very different than what it looks like in the South or in other regions of the world. Um, and also, since we're so uniquely situated, you know, being literally the top of like, then we can be role models of like, this is what this worked in the Arctic. If this can work there, it could almost work anywhere, right? Because that means it's friggin' tough and really, really inspiring. Yeah, well said, Kate. I, I, I do think, it, you, you know, that's, I, I've heard this, and I think when I went on my Arctic expedition, I think many of the SOI folks can agree, is the Arctic connects the rest of the world together, um, just as, as the vice versa, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, the, the, the chocolate chip and Earl Grey, that connection too as well. I mean, it's very small things, you know, um, we are people, we live in this place that's can be cold and extreme and tough at times. And yet we all band together and do similar things in lives, right? You know, we, we go out and shovel snow um, as winter comes, right? And, uh, you know, we, we enjoy the, the land that is provided for us and the beauty of, of all of it. And I agree. You know, I think, you know, maybe to share a little bit about my side is, so in 2015, I went to the Arctic. I was originally from California. So a, a non-Arctic 
you know, kiddo back in the day, but um, here I am in Alaska now, you know, um, it's, it's been, it's been quite a journey for me. I'm a almost full Alaskan, I think in many ways and almost full Arctic <laughs> goer. Um, I think I know how to walk on ice and snow now fully. So I think I'm close enough to it. Uh, I like skiing and all the outdoor activities too. So you know something about that but um and then how do we how do i now an example you know fight and and, and understand and, un, and try to comprehend these issues that we're facing in the arctic and how can we as you know as personally as anthropologists and political scientists deal with these issues um formally right so um anyways that's a little tidbit about myself and that connection you know so um you know one thing maybe that we can talk a little bit about, Kate, is so we've spoken about Arctic policy and kind of the broad spectrum of it, but maybe we could share with some of our listeners what specific policies there might be that maybe you're working on um, currently, uh, or maybe things that we could all be working on. For sure. Uh, currently, I'm working on a policy paper um, in relationship with other organizations speaking to how it's a little bit broad but speaking to how indigenous youth <clears throat> in a broader context are the ones predominantly doing the land defense work and water defense work and viewing that as actual work. You know what I mean? Like instead of uh, criminalizing indigenous people for defending their territories, that's actually asserting rights. That's not criminalization. And uh, I think on the within everyday folks um, being aware to policy, and uh, also like, how do we make policy that is inclusive? Um, we also, we always have this top-down approach which is just colonialism, right? So how do we decolonize our, our policy processes? It's, it's bottom up, easy peasy, lemon squeezy in theory, right? But it actually makes folks really uncomfortable. And why does it make folks uncomfortable? It's because it challenges their position of power. And so if we're going to move forward and properly advocating for the protection of our land territories and resources, uh, it needs to be created by community first. And um, I think a really exciting conversation I've been having with uh, like my roommates and other folks in my circles is I think there's really interesting um, directions that we could go in. And what keeps playing in my head is when it comes to language. And how do we get indigenous languages into the ways that we create policy, right? Because our language is from the land. It's our relationship to the land. It comes from the land. There's like words that are miles long that describe, you know, what type of ice you're gonna be on. What, what's the water like that day? <clears throat> and I think that's what we're, we're missing in that policy making piece. We're missing the language. Uh, but also it comes with lots of other questions. How do you do that ethically? How do you make sure you avoid you know, um, cultural appropriation or exploitation. Um, when I, I can't answer those questions yet, but I feel like this is a very integral piece that we're missing within policy is the relational piece between what's actually what we're doing, how it affects the land and what we're actually writing about. Um, and that I think everybody can make policy. Anybody can do it. Right. We've seen we've seen all of the leaders in the world. Right. We're like, you know what? I could do what you do. And I know it's hard for a lot of young people because we we do walk with that imposter syndrome. We are told that we're too young to be in these places um, or we don't know what we're talking about. But that's just not true. Um, we belong to be there. Even by being in the room, you're forcing people to think differently, to look at the problem differently, to even speak differently, because even your present shakes them a little bit. And that's okay. It's okay to shake people uh, within like respectfully way, of course, but um, it's okay to make folks question why they do the things that they do, um, especially if it's for the betterment of others. Yeah, that's uh, wow, hundred percent. I you also just answered the, the next question that I was also going to ask you about is essentially why why folks are intimidated with you know getting involved with policy you know and it's it can be very tough and you know you're you're speaking to you know high powered officials who have the ability to change your life and your community. Um, how do you you know give them the elevator pitch that stands for everything that you're fighting for? Um, mm -hmm. 
those are tough, tough tasks and, and roles to take on, right? Um, maybe, I, I don't this is kind of a tangent then, do you have any tips to kind of getting over that intimidation? Um, maybe personally, what do you do to mm-hmm. kind of get involved um, with policy? As you just said, it's so easy. Um, yeah. <laughs> For sure. I think um, it's funny that you say it can be intimidating because uh, I just did the SOI nature retreat with the CAC, right? And uh, one of the coordinators was like, policy intimidates me. And I was like, it doesn't have to, right? And I'm like, Pol- policy should be empowering. Um, if you are taking part in creating a policy, that should empower you. Um, and I know for myself, like, uh, I still very much think like I'm a child, uh, even though I'm 26 years old. And uh, I'm like literally only 4'11". Like I'm a very small little Enoch uh, just trying to get in there. And uh, <clears throat> it took a lot of uh, going into the washroom, closing the bathroom stall and like taking three breaths and being like, no, I belong to be here. I belong to be here. And <clears throat> if I'm here, that means others can be here too. Um, I've also been to UNESCO's youth forum. I was the first indigenous youth to represent Canada in this forum in 2019 again. And that was a, that was a tough experience because there's heads of states and all these fancy dancy people. And at the same time too, being like, no, I can be here because they're here. And then they used to be like me too. And just trying to like, remind myself of that and taking deep breaths and also recognizing is actually my ancestral right. And uh, it is my ancestral right to be in this room making decisions. And uh, I think that the more we tell other Indigenous youth that too, like, no, this is what the ancestors gave you is a voice and you are to use it uh, for your community, for yourself, um, for the land, for the water, and for the four-legged. Like, this is what your responsibility is. Um, might make it a little bit more inviting, but also with those folks who are policymakers and the fancy dancy people and the power suits of then stopping them and telling them and inviting them with you to walk this journey, right? I think it's a very important as well of being like, I want to be in relationship with you because I think you and I can make really good work together. Let's do it together. It's also, it's like, you're not doing it alone. (laughs) And also you're having that piece with another person to support them and looking at things differently as well. Yeah, that's, that's an extremely important reminder, I think, to, to all students on ice as well, and to people from across the Arctic and around the world, um, it extends to everyone, you know, and, and you know, SOI is, is a great platform as well for the number of people that you've met and that you will meet and, um, you know, have connections with wonderful people like Kate, who are here, you know, and, you know, Kate is a little busy with the master's right now, but you know, reach out to Kate, you know, talk to Kate, you know, she has experience and thoughts that, that can propel you to, to work on policy, to better your communities in many mm-hmm. ways. Right. Um, yeah. So earlier you mentioned the, the climate action cohort that mm-hmm. SOI held um, at the retreat, I believe. And I think you held a session at one of these um, retreats uh, and you, you have facilitated kind of a climate policy discussion. Um, could you maybe walk us through what that was like and um, maybe a recap to, to all of our students on ICE, uh, you know, bridge podcast listeners. Absolutely. I had a great time, uh, such outstanding youth. Uh, so I am a loosey goosey as a facilitator. Uh, I've worked with youth since I was like 18. Um, so I really just listen for the vibe, you know, and, um, one day it was just absolutely pouring rain and it was just like so beautiful though but I was like but we're gonna go do a land activity and uh it's one of my favorite activities to do is that you just go into nature and uh you make a picture of what inspires you most about nature from nature pardon me so then you can take like a bunch of rocks and you create a tree right and then everybody stood in a circle and was discussing of like why they picked what they picked um and what spoke to them and how they've never looked at land like art before 
And I was like, isn't that fun? I stole it from a curriculum when I was used to be like a preschool teacher. Um, and it just, it never misses between the ages of four to like 35, it's always gonna be a hit. Um, and then we went on walks because uh, the last couple of days were very nice and sunny. And I got folks to, you know, walk with somebody you haven't really talked with yet and talk about why policy is boring. Uh, why do you feel it's in, uh, inaccessible? Why do you think it works? Why do you think it doesn't work? Um, where have you seen policy that you go, that's really great? Or have you seen like, that actually really sucks? And we've had these discussions of, you know, just building people up so they can be ready to enter those spaces, which I think is very foundational. And uh, something that I wish I had, you know, somebody to mentor me and support me in my earlier stages, because as I got more, when I got older, I had more folks in the corner cheering me on <clears throat> in the professional space. I've always had my family being like, you can do anything and, and trying to explain to my parents what I do for a living. I don't even try anymore. My parents make up jobs and I go, sure, I do that. And, <laughs> um, you know, being like, oh, again, I can, I belong to be here. I can make this policy. And then of course, like taking it on to a step further of with their community projects of being like, what policies um, would affect your project? Um, and then also linking it into of like, what calls to the action from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission can you include your project? You know, so we're also being in that in relational piece within the territories that we're operating on and in the relationships with the indigenous people, with what areas that you're living in. Um, <clears throat> and uh, pretty soon at the end of this month, we'll be getting ready for our couple other sessions that I'll have with them too, discussing more policy and with folks from the ECCC as well. Yeah, it's, it's amazing that the, I think you just walked us through kind of the session and, and you know, what the, the, the process of, of going through, you know, reflection and understanding calls to action, moving towards policy in many ways. Um, a little reflection on my end, if, if that's all right. Um, so I, uh, Students on Ice has always been a part of, I think once you're a part of this community, you are in. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I got a chance to, to go with the alumni team to the Arctic Futures 2050 conference in DC uh, in 2019. Um, so worked with uh, Rachel Bohr, Linda, mm -hmm. and, and all the wonderful people um, that you probably know. Yep. <laughs> and, um, you know, we had a whole team of folks from across Students on Ice years um, that and, uh, you know, walking into DC was a very daunting experience, right? That like we've spoken about it in this this podcast today about mm -hmm. how intimidating it can be to see, you know, have, you know, an example, the Smithsonian mm -hmm. director sitting to your left and then, uh, you know, indigenous elder sitting to your right and you're in between, right? And how do you bring them together mm -hmm. to talk to you, right? And have a meaningful conversation that goes somewhere that leads to policy, that leads to, you know, a movement, a, a momentum, right, driver. Um, so, you know, how do you bring that together and, 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 and you know, maybe attending one of Kate's sessions is, is one of the ways to better kind of reorganize your thinking. Um, and I, that's something that I struggled with uh, throughout the whole conference and how to stay fully turned on, you know, for a whole entire week. And you have to do this constantly, right? How do you pitch students on ice to somebody um, who personally just wants to go on an expedition, yeah. but telling that it's more than that. It's, it's, it's learning about the places, the people, seeing the places, examining cultures and identities, right? Um, I can go on and on, but um, yeah, that's that's kind of what I thought about it too. So, but uh, mm -hmm. definitely, yeah. and then also like letting folks, supporting folks, understanding that uh, people in the community already know how to solve their problems, right? And so, <clears throat> how do we integrate? like that approach of like community already knows how to take care of community. It's always been that way. And so this influx of, you know, colonization that it's been harder for that to be seen. And um, what can, you know, indigenous and non-indigenous people work together to bring back that approach that community knows how to take care of community. And I think during that time that I was with the, the youth from the 
climate cohorts like they were just so fun and it was definitely like a reminder for me to like why I keep doing what I do and also like uh if folks like that are around like we're gonna be okay yeah everything's gonna be all right um last question I, I already brought this up earlier but uh, I think it's a great way to kind of wrap up our, our podcast here today um but uh you know what advice do you have for for folks or youth looking to get into policy work um connect the dots for us Kate <laughs> well I have great news you don't have to compete in beauty pageants uh, <laughs> there is so many other ways you can get involved in policy um I would definitely like um hone in on a a theme a cause that is very very close to your heart and do your best to look through other organizations or like literally just other youth in your community that feel the same way that you do um and don't stop talking about it until somebody listens and uh advocacy and policy go hand in hand and you know also recognizing that like rest is a part of advocacy and policy making it's okay to rest in between and also to like listen to your body when you're doing this work because it can be very very tiring um <clears throat> and so rest we need to rest eat we need to eat drink water we need to drink water and uh also joy is a very big part of policy as well um if it's not bringing you joy it's okay you don't have to do it anymore um it's okay to pass on your work to somebody else. It will get done and it will be done in a good way. And uh, policy is for everybody. I, that's, that's, that's a wrap. That's perfect. Um, it is for everybody and I totally agree. Okay, any final words for us um, beyond that? Um, if not, we wanna thank you so much for your time and your knowledge um, and, and you know, your, your willingness to join us today. Um, SOI is always so happy and glad to, to connect people like this, but I'll give you the platform real quick. For sure. No, thank you for having me. And like, it was such a privilege because also like that was uh, a little bit of a healing time for me too, being uh, with you folks, because Linda actually knows my whole entire family. And um, she got to tell me stories of my grandma because my grandma passed away and I was very young and she knew my grandma and she... Linda taught me a new throat singing song so I could teach my sister and so um, really recognizing like people do have a big impact on people um, in the spaces that you meet and uh, there's lessons everywhere there's teachings everywhere and it's okay to ask questions and I'm going to be bothering Linda probably forever <laughs> and um, that people should be excited about the work that they do. And if you're not excited, it's okay to try something new. Thank you so much, Kate. Thank this you. is Students on Ice Bridge. Uh, thanks for tuning in and uh, look forward to more podcasts.